This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And this is to satisfy the youngsters who say that I don't get the type of music youngsters want. This is more a little in the rock and roll vein. The Four Lovers and the Apple Number. Now, boys, take it. presents this program in color. See the nice man? He is asleep beneath the tree. Everything is peaceful and serene. Do you know why it is always nice and peaceful here? It is make-believe. That is why. Real worlds are different. We know. We work against real cancer in the real world. Last year, over 200,000 people were cured of cancer. Annual checkups can help save thousands more, if only the people would come. See your doctor when you think everything is nice and rosy. That is smart. Do you know why we talk to you like this? Because when we talk to you like adults, you don't listen. SSP, 17 great machines. And folks, for 1972, SSP has done it again. It's the new Red Hot Indy Racer. Railbird, the Demon Dragster. The Space Age Blackjack. The Daring Dodge Super Stalker. Yes, sir. There's power of plane from the SSPs for 72. Test drive one today. SSP by Kenner. Each SSP racer sold separately. located at 29 Ford Green Place in Brooklyn, New York. And now the staff and management of WNYETV Channel 25 wishes one and all a very good day. Broadcasting the 
Washington D. New York City, presenting educational and professional and public service programs of special interest to the Boston Museum. As part of the municipal broadcasting system, Channel 31 broadcasts from the sign frequency of 572 to 578 megahertz by authority of the Federal Communications Commission. The station operates under the direct supervision of Mayor John B. Lindsay as part of the Municipal Service Administration. This is West Virginia with FM receiving an entry for a man megahertz to WNYC FM, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We now give you the best. From CBS News headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Robert Barr in Kansas City, Missouri, Ike Pappas in Independence, Missouri, Charles Kuralt in Independence, Neil Strausser in Washington, and George Natanson in Managua, Nicaragua. Good evening. Former President Harry S. Truman died this morning at age 88. The long vigil at Kansas City's research hospital came to an end when hospital spokesman Wayne Connery made the announcement. The Honorable Harry S. Truman, 33rd President of the United States, died at 7.50 a.m. at Research Hospital and Medical Center. They waited patiently for the presidential proclamation of mourning before lowering the flag outside Kansas City's research hospital. It was done calmly and with dignity, very much in keeping with the former president's last hours here. He was in a deep coma then, his body swiftly giving way. For three weeks, he had fought off the effects of advancing age and a weakened heart, even when the drugs were no longer working. He went quickly this morning, a hospital source said, but peacefully. Harry Truman's neighbors on North Delaware Street Independence did not wait for a presidential proclamation to honor their neighbor. When word of the end came, they quietly lowered their flags to half-staff and then took a moment to remember what they liked best about him. I think his friendliness. I mean, how often do you have this close a connection to somebody of this integrity and have him always willing to speak to you and to stop and talk to you and uh, to make you feel like as if he knew you? This is the thing that sticks in my mind more than anything else. What do you think is the reaction of your neighbors in Independence? Well, I can't speak for my neighbors, but you can see the flags that are flying on the homes of the neighbors are half mask. I think this says it. They're really quite sorry, I'm sure. I know we all feel like we've lost a good friend. The flag was also lowered this morning at number 219 North Delaware, the Truman residence. A lone Secret Service man stood guard on the lawn as within Mr. Truman's wife, Bess, the childhood sweetheart he married 53 years ago, mourned. She had suffered with him through the long hours and days of the hospital vigil, and she was tired. Late this afternoon, Mrs. Truman, accompanied by her daughter, Mrs. Margaret Truman Daniel, and her husband, left to go to Carson's funeral home, where the former president's body was now prepared for repose. There was little else stirring today from the house on North Delaware. Mike Pappas, CBS News, Independence. The funeral observances will last for two days, but without the pomp and fanfare usually accorded to great statesmen, this was the request of Mr. Truman himself. Tomorrow, the body will go by motorcade from the Carson Funeral Home in Independence to the Truman Library and will lie in state there for 24 hours. Thursday, after funeral services in the library's auditorium, Mr. Truman will be buried on the library grounds in a quiet and private ceremony. President Nixon does not plan to attend the funeral, but he and Mrs. Nixon will fly to Independence tomorrow for a wreath-laying ceremony at the library. As you go through the years, you can suffer from arthritis. Mentholatum Deep Heating Rub can help with the minor pains of arthritis. Rub it in gently. Its deep heating action sinks in, starts a glow, warms away the pain. Deep heating rub or deep heating lotion from mentholatum. Deep heating. If you ever suffer from acid indigestion, this little tablet contains one of the most effective medicines ever discovered for it. In tests at a famous college, it proved to neutralize excess acid in a matter of seconds. 
prepared for a little shock. It's Tums, now in five flavors. It'll make your stomach feel better now. In 1944, President Roosevelt selected Missouri Senator Harry Truman as his running mate for the fourth term. They won. 82 days after the start of the new term, Roosevelt died, thus beginning the Truman years in the White House. Pray for me. Harry Truman said right after Roosevelt died that he was sworn in as 33rd President of the United States. Truman needed all the prayers he could get, for he had a great deal to do. He approved the United Nations Charter in San Francisco less than three months after taking office. He sailed for Europe in his first meeting with Allied war leaders in Potsdam, Germany. He came here to discuss post-war problems with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. He hoped for mutual understanding, but got instead the Iron Curtain, a divided Germany, a divided Korea. That same month, he authorized the destruction of Hiroshima by the first atomic bomb. Three days later, a second bomb and the war with Japan was over. The Marshall Plan allocated billions of dollars to restore Europe's shattered economy, but Russia refused to join. Later, Truman advocated aid to underdeveloped areas. Meanwhile, another trouble spot, Truman recognizing the newly independent state of Israel. Relations with Moscow continued to deteriorate. The Cold War was on. Berlin was blockaded. Truman ordered supplies airlifted to the beleaguered city. The blockade and airlift lasted 11 months. Truman had called Russia's bluff. But he himself was in deep political trouble back home. Even the Democrats thought Truman could not win. But he confounded them all, especially one newspaper. And he fooled pollsters and politicians alike and delighted in having fooled the commentators, especially H.V. Kaltenborn. Well, about 12 o'clock, I happened to wake up for some reason. And the radio was turned on on the National Broadcasting Company. And Mr. Kelton Barn. <laughs> and Mr. Hartness were reporting the situation as it then developed. And Mr. Kelton Barn was saying, Well, the president uh, is a million votes ahead in the popular vote we have yet to hear. In his second term, Truman signed the North Atlantic Treaty. NATO was born. Communist North Koreans invaded South Korea. Truman, without seeking a congressional declaration of war, sent U.S. troops to the rescue. Americans involved in a ground war in Asia. There was trouble with General MacArthur over the U.S. purpose in Korea. The issue of ultimate authority was at stake. Truman relieved MacArthur of command. By 1952, he had enough of the White House, and though he campaigned hard for Adlai Stevenson, he was not surprised when Eisenhower won. After the inauguration, with his wife and daughter Margaret, he went home to independence. A fuller review of the former president's life will follow here on CBS at 7.30 tonight, 6.30 Central Time, and then at 11.30 tonight, 10.30 Central Time, CBS News will present a broadcast in which some distinguished friends of Harry Truman reminisce about him. Private citizens and the great have expressed sorrow at Mr. Truman's passing. From the Florida White House, President Nixon praised his old political foe as a man with far-sighted leadership and enormous courage. Mr. Nixon said he did what had to be done, when it had to be done, and generations to come will be in his debt. The president also proclaimed Thursday a day of national mourning, which means government offices will be closed. In addition, he ordered that flags on government buildings and U.S. ships remain at half-staff for the next 30 days. Lyndon Johnson, now the nation's only living ex-president, eulogized Mr. Truman as a 20th century giant. And Barry Goldwater, Republican senator, said he may well become regarded as the best president we have had in this century, a man who knew how to make decisions and stick by them. One old colleague mourning his friend's death was former House Speaker John McCormick, who said, we were poker pals, and you know how close they can become. Nothing is more embarrassing than having your dentures slip. I know. I wear dentures myself. So when I've been into something hard, I worried. But I found confident. A plastic formula denture adhesive. They guarantee confident holds tighter, longer, better than anything you've used. If you don't agree, return it to them for your money back. Get confident.
Stop worrying about your dentures. If you have trouble getting to sleep night after night, it might be a good idea to discuss the problem with your doctor. However, if you have only an occasional problem, you might like to know about Sleepies. It was tested in a hospital. And it's the only leading sleeping tablet with only relaxing ingredients. Just two relaxers to help soothe minor tensions so you can relax and get to sleep. Taken as directed, Sleepies is safe and effective. America's 24-hour ceasefire stretched on to 36 hours before it ended the day with new bombing strikes on North Vietnam's heartland. In Paris, North Vietnam said the United States seemed bent on demolishing Hanoi, Haiphong, and other populous areas. Neil Strausser has more on this story from the Pentagon. Pentagon spokesman Jerry Friedheim confirmed the announcement from the U.S. command in Saigon. U.S. planes are again bombing throughout North Vietnam. But he declined to say whether B-52s have returned to the heavily defended Hanoi area. This morning, uh, our time at their regular briefing, MACV announced that U.S. air crews had resumed operations over North Vietnam after a 36, 36 hour holiday stand down and that U.S. air crews resumed operations in the Republic of Vietnam after a 24 hour stand down in South Vietnam. Are you all still continuing to fly uh, B-52s <coughs> in Hanoi? The uh, B-52s continue to be a part of the operation. Are you flying them over Hanoi, Hanoi? I don't have specifics to give you about where they have been since the stand down period. They are not flying over Hanoi, Hanoi? I don't have specific targets to discuss with you. Friedheim said the air campaign has inflicted significant damage over the North, but press refused to elaborate. Well, it's, it's our judgment that the American public uh, supports the uh, withholding of information from the enemy that might endanger the lives of air crews that are still flying and in our best uh, judgment in this building that situation still obtains. He was positive on one point despite the B-52 losses communist missile accuracy has not improved. It still takes 50 or 60 firings to bring down one plane. The loss rate to SAMs is not materially different from what it was uh, in the early months of the linebacker in the spring when there were heavy firings. Just a the difference here uh, which you all have obviously taken note of, is the fact that B-52s have been lost uh, because of the place that they were flying this time. Is there any new evidence, Jerry? The number of SAM strikes, SAM hits, has not changed much and it remains relatively well, was low. was expected to lose as many B-52s? Again, we did know what sort of defenses we were going against, yes. The American command made no mention of losses in today's strikes, but North Vietnam claimed to have shot down eight more of the big bombers. That makes a total of 26 that they've claimed. Hanoi Radio said many aggressor pilots have been captured today. In South Vietnam, 35 rockets struck the Allied base at Da Nang. One American was wounded, a helicopter was destroyed, four others were damaged. In at least one instance, the United States has answered back to criticism of its latest bombing strikes on Hanoi and Haiphong. Last week, Premier Olaf Palma of Sweden condemned the air raids and compared them with World War II Nazi atrocities. Today, a State Department spokesman said the U.S. has protested Palma's remarks. When your arthritis hurts, how much pain reliever do you want? The makers of Bufferin know there is more than one answer for the temporary relief of pain from minor arthritis. That's why they made Arthritis Strength Bufferin. It has more pain reliever in each tablet than regular Bufferin. And like Bufferin, has ingredients to help protect from aspirin upset. Arthritis Strength Bufferin. When you want a tablet with even more pain reliever than in regular Bufferin. Jim, when you were completely gray, you did look older. Hmm. I can't believe how much better you look with just a touch of gray. Announcing Grecian Formula 16. It's practically clear. As easy to use as hair tonic. No mess. Use it every day until you slowly, gradually get rid of just as much gray as you want. Some of it, or all of it. Then once a week or so to keep it that way. I use it too, and he doesn't even know it. Grecian Formula 16. 
Nicaraguan officials in Miami today issued an urgent appeal for blood donors. They said there's an immediate need for 20 to 25,000 pints of whole blood for the victims of Saturday's earthquake in Managua. Other relief supplies are on their way. The United States sending $3 million in food, medicine, tents, purification equipment, and other aid. Looting continued today in what's left of the Nicaraguan capital, with troops doing little or nothing to stop it. George Nadinson has today's report from the ruined city. Ninety percent of the city has been utterly destroyed. Even the few tall buildings which do remain will soon be brought down by dynamiting. According to engineering surveys which have been carried out over the past days, there is not a single building in the downtown section safe for occupancy. The city will be leveled, as explained by Nicaragua's former president and now commander-in-chief of the armed forces, Anastasio Somoza. So the capital, as you now know it, will cease to exist? That is right. We are going to live in tents until we make an appreciation of the situation and uh, decide, the government will have to decide what they're going to do. Martial law has been declared. The army is now in full command of the city and the country. General Somoza is overflying the city in a U.S. helicopter. He will personally direct the demolition operations to level the city. A field hospital flown in by the United States has been set up to care for the many thousands of injured. A mass inoculation campaign is underway to prevent the spread of any epidemic. Typhoid is the most feared. Official estimates of the death are placed at about 2,000. But as rescue work continues, this figure continues to mount. Unofficial estimates of the dead are running as high as 5,000. Many of these people have been without a drink of water for 24 hours, without food for more than that. They stand patiently in line at the Red Cross headquarters, waiting for a cup of rice or flour or other staple. Bulldozers working through the streets of the city continue to uncover bodies buried beneath the rubble. One family of three was found crushed beneath the wreckage, apparently asleep at the time of the quake early Saturday morning. There is no burial for the bodies found. Because of the conditions of the body, they are burned for health reasons on the street where they were found after being doused with gasoline. George Nathanson, CBS News, Managua. The world knows now of this amazing survival on a Chilean mountainside of 16 plane crash victims. 29 others died in that October 13th crash or within the next several days. The passengers were young Uruguayan rugby players, some members of their families and other fans. Today, the terrible truth was revealed. The survivors had sustained life during their 69-day ordeal by consuming the dead. They said they had reached their decision after long philosophical discussion and a unanimous vote. And one survivor compared their action as similar to a heart transplant, taking from the dead to sustain the living. More than a dozen major banks today raised their prime interest rate for corporate customers from five and three quarters to six percent. Treasury Secretary George Shultz said he was disappointed at this latest round of interest hikes, touched off last week by First National City, the nation's second biggest bank. The averages were generally higher on the New York Stock Exchange. Volume was light, only 11,100,000 shares. The average price per share gained 13 cents on the New York Exchange, lost 4 cents on the American. Both exchanges will be closed Thursday because of President Truman's funeral. Everyone thinks of me as a bookworm, but I have another side, the inside. I'm clad in a great fizz t-shirt and French blue hip briefs. I have jockey underwear in almost every style and color. I may look like Wally Cox, but inside I'm Tyrone Power. Jockey brand fashion underwear, what the well-undressed man is wearing this year. Several leading doctors report common stomach distress is often caused by trapped gas. Churning bubbles cause heartburn, pressure, stuffiness. Right here. Antacids alone can't dissolve bubbles, but Digel can. Digel combines antacids plus cymethicone that breaks up bubbles. Look, Digel with cymethicone dissolves bubbles away. Heartburn, pressure, stuffiness go fast. Digel relieves both excess acid and gas for more complete relief. Harry Truman once said, 
I don't give a hoot what history says about me. I know what I've done, and that's enough. Now, Mr. Truman loved history so much that he knew that really wasn't enough. In 1957, one of his fondest dreams was realized with the dedication of the Harry S. Truman Library in Independence. It contains three and a half million letters, documents, and records of his administration, and appropriately, the grounds will be his burial place. Charles Corral visited there, and here is his report. Harry Truman's grandfather was a wagon master. His father was a horse trader, and his mother, his mother could be called a pioneer woman, and she had certain prejudices. The Yankee troops had robbed the family farm during the Civil War, and so when her son, the president, invited Martha Young Truman to the White House years later, the one thing she would not do was sleep in Mr. Lincoln's bed. She had an intellectual bent. She was interested in music and books more interested than most people in the independence of those days probably were. And it was she who saw that Harry Truman studied piano. It was she who saw that when he needed glasses for reading, he wore glasses. Harry Truman at the age of eight, wearing glasses. He grew up in independence, went to the independence high school, and in the yearbook of 1901, The Gleam, H. Truman is shown standing between L. Garrett and Will Long. Also in that high school class was Charlie Ross, who was later to be his press secretary, and Bess Wallace, who was later to be his wife. Harry Truman worked. During high school, he worked at Jim Clinton's drugstore in Independence, and he remembered that his first week's pay was three silver dollars. After high school, he had to work. His father lost his small amount of capital in a fall in grain futures in 1901, the year Harry Truman graduated from high school. So he couldn't go to college. For a while, he worked as a timekeeper for a construction gang on the Santa Fe Railroad down by the river. He worked in the mailroom of the Kansas City Star. He worked for a bank in Kansas City and lived in a boarding house where, by one of those coincidences of history, a friend was Arthur Eisenhower the brother of a man who was also to be president. Arthur Eisenhower remembered before his death that after they had paid their room and board, he and Harry Truman only had about a dollar a week left for riotous living. And still, Harry Truman, he said, never missed one of the vaudeville shows that came to the old Orpheum or the Grand. After a taste of city life, Harry Truman moved back to his mother's family farm in Grand View, Missouri, and worked for several years at being a farmer. But the proudest thing he did in those days was to join the Missouri National Guard. His grandmother, whose relatives all wore gray, was not overjoyed when her grandson came home in a blue uniform, but he wore it with pride. And that is how it happened that when World War I broke out and Battery D, 129th Field Artillery Regiment, went to war, the battery commander was Captain Harry Truman. Battery D had the reputation of being, frankly, a little rambunctious. But their commander told them in France, look, I didn't come over here to get along with you. You have to get along with me. And through a number of campaigns in the war in France, they got along. But it wasn't the ribbons that Harry Truman won during the war that would influence his future life. It was the friends he made. One of them was Eddie Jacobson. People tend to think of Harry Truman as a haberdasher. Well, for three years after the war, he was. He and his army buddy, Eddie Jacobson, ran a haberdashery on 12th Street in Kansas City until 1922, when it went broke. There he was, 38 years old, out of work, in debt, no prospects for the future, and recently married. He had married Bess Wallace the month after he was discharged in 1919. At that point, he turned to another old army friend, James Pendergast, who was the nephew of Tom Pendergast, the Kansas City Democratic boss. Pendergast endorsed Truman as the Democratic candidate for judge of the Eastern District of Jackson County, the equivalent of county commissioner. He ran on a platform of good roads, economy, a day's work for a day's pay, and he won. 
Harry Truman was in politics to stay. Well, almost to stay. The voters gave him a vacation in 1924, the only election he ever lost. But he ran again in 1926, this time for presiding judge of the county, and again on a good roads platform. A few years later, he was able to put out a handsome book under his signature as presiding judge, showing all the paved roads and handsome overpasses of Jackson County. There are some old people around here who still remember him as the man who paved the roads. In 1934, he decided he'd like to run for the House of Representatives, but Boss Pendergast had another candidate in mind for that job. He told Harry Truman, if you'd like to run for the Senate, I'll support you. Truman campaigned all over this state in an old Dodge car, visiting every county seat, I suppose. And it wasn't long after the election that 10-year-old Margaret Truman was crying and asking her mother, where's Washington and what's a senator? There were some people in Washington who thought that this particular senator was just Tom Pendergast's man. But the Capitol learned eventually that Harry Truman was his own man. When he was finally free of Washington in 1953, he turned much of his energy to the establishment of this library. Not as a monument to himself, that he said would be unworthy, but as a place for teaching about the presidency. Mr. Truman said once that he felt strongly that a man who had been president should go back after his term of office and see if he couldn't give the people more information about what makes the greatest government in the history of the world run. They say I'm a fanatic about that, Mr. Truman said, and I guess I am. He left standing orders with the staff of this library that whenever school children came to this auditorium, he was to be interrupted, no matter who he was talking to on the telephone, no matter who his visitor might be. And invariably, he would come here and stand on this stage and lecture the children about the United States government. He did that hundreds of times, and sometimes as often as three times in one day. But of course, this is the room we will remember him in, the reproduction of the president's office at the White House. He filled this office. He brought to it a powerful sense of history. He understood the system. He knew that the court is strong, that the Congress is strong, and that if the thing is to work, the presidency, the president, must be strong. In one of his last published letters to C.L. Salzberger of the New York Times, he wrote, as a practical matter, somebody has to be in charge. Someone has to make decisions, and that someone is the president. He said it in a number of ways. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And in that famous sign that was always on his desk, the buck stops here. And that's the way it is. Tuesday, December 26, 1972. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. I started taking Bayer Time Release Aspirin when my arthritis kicked up. Works so well that now I use it for other things. Like achy colds and flu that can make you feel miserable all day. It's Bayer Aspirin in time release form so that you get a gentle flow of pain relief that lasts and lasts. You only take it every eight hours. Believe me, when you need pain relief over a long period of time, Bayer Time Release Aspirin is a blessing. It's Arbor Day, Charlie Brown. Then, Willona and Florida blow the whistle on crime on Good Times. <laughs> Tuesday night here on CBS. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown! Join the Peanuts gang for a merry Charlie Brown Christmas. Then, share the joy and magic of Santa's arrival on Twas the Night Before Christmas. Two happy holiday specials starting at 8, 7 Central and Mountain Time. Monday on CBS. Saturday, laughable, lovable, Frosty the Snowman comes to life in the heartwarming story of a little girl's love, an original holiday classic. 
Then was the night before Christmas, an enchanting tale about boys and girls everywhere on the most important night of the year. Two holiday treats, Saturday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain. Monday. The Peanuts gang is filled with the Christmas spirit. Until tonight from Pablo Pizza, Charlie Brown Christmas. More U.S. Monday Marines and Army soldiers hit the ground and get ready to roll. We now return for a final Rudolph, assault from the, the Taliban Rindy. to hunt for Osama bin Laden and to deliver humanitarian aid. We'll bring you complete coverage inside Afghanistan. Also tonight, the life and death of a music legend, the Beatles, George Harrison. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Continuing coverage of the war on terrorism. Reporting tonight from Kabul, Afghanistan, here is Dan Rather. Good evening from Kabul, Afghanistan. Another major story tonight is the passing of George Harrison. The former Beatle died in Los Angeles from cancer, his family by his side. He was 58 years old. Harrison's life and music reached for the same notes, inner strength and inner peace, and struck a chord with millions. CBS's Mark Phillips reports on the death and life of George Harrison. There's a Beatles song for just about every occasion. I read the news today, oh boy. And today, the news was bad. They gathered at the John Lennon Memorial in New York to mark the death of another Beatle. And then there were two. George Harrison's death, unlike Lennon's, was neither sudden, nor violent, nor shocking. His religious conviction, he had said, expressed in his first solo hit single, had prepared him for death. Of all the Beatles, George Harrison hadn't been the brash one, or the cute one, or the funny one. He'd been the thoughtful one, seeking not fame, but answers. The purpose of life is to find out who am I, why am I here, um, um, where am I going? That's the, what we need answering. And Harrison, as his friends knew, had found those answers. I'm just privileged to have known him. And I love him like he's my brother. It was a very sad day for me and for a lot of other people. It's a big cigarette I will for a big man. George Harrison had had throat, then lung, then brain cancer. The cigarette gags, amusing when he was young, had long since stopped being funny. The man they called the reluctant Beatle is now getting the credit he is due. He was the musical backbone. His were the riffs the whole world played air guitar to. He led the group on its journey toward Eastern mysticism. And he, too, was the songwriter of enduring tunes. Even Sinatra called Something the best love song of the past 50 years. If the Beatles provided the soundtrack for a generation, Harrison provided the theme songs for his own life. It doesn't take long to be from 17 to being 57. Mm. 40 years just goes like that. In his life, George Harrison never saw himself as more than he was, a working class rocker from Liverpool who was good enough and lucky enough to become famous around the world. More than guitars are gently weeping today. Mark Phillips, CBS News, London. Next up on the Friday CBS Evening News, the political blame game heats up over the downturn in the U.S. economy. Good evening. We're beginning with an ending, and we're doing this to give you a better idea of what's been lost. There was a car wreck in Manhattan last night, nothing remarkable, except the one person killed was Bob Simon. Simon was in his 19th season on 60 Minutes, and before that, he'd spent nearly 30 years on this program. He was among the most courageous and gifted reporters of our time, and he reminded us how good journalism can be. I'm from the Bronx, and in fact, it took a long time before CBS would put me on the air because I had, had such a thick Bronx accent. We're going to pick up an American. The voice would become unmistakable, the perspective 
indispensable. They don't know how many communists they're up against. They do know the enemy bunkers are less than 30 feet away. Bob Simon hurried to Southeast Asia in 1971 because, as he put it, history was being made. Civilian casualties were not announced, but it was another case of destroying a village in order to save it. Once you've covered a war, he said, there's nothing like it. So after he left Vietnam on one of the last helicopters out, he went back to war 34 times, asking questions that were straight, simple, devastating. General, you've got the reputation of being a first-rate Israeli officer. Why are your soldiers killing so many kids? Simon took risks, and the people who liked to control information hated him for it. But the audience was always the wiser. The Israelis had no idea that we were filming them. And the Israelis caught up with the Palestinian boys and just beat the hell out of them. I mean, very vicious. They were beating them with stones. We got that, we filmed it, and that created a big scandal. During the Gulf War in 1991, Simon was captured by Iraqi forces, along with producer Peter Bluff and their crew, Roberto Alvarez and Juan Caldera. And we eventually wound up in the um, secret police headquarters called the Muhabarat and treated very badly. They were beaten, threatened with death, but released after 40 days. As you can see, we've lost a little weight. We've aged a little, but we're fine. Simon mastered something about television that others miss. The power is in the words. And with fine detail and sleight of hand, he delivered the truth you never saw coming. Does anyone know her name? No, we don't know her name. She died quickly, this girl with no name. Sarajevo is going slowly to the grave embarrassment of all those countries who've decided to let it happen. War was not his only adventure. He went into the wild often, especially in these latter years. You want to rub her down? Go on, rub her down. An animal is never duplicitous. It's very refreshing to go see them after you've spent a lot of time interviewing politicians. Even in the Arctic, Simon enjoyed the more civilized side of life. The scotch is 20 years old. The ice is about 2,000. There are strange bubbles, and the idea is rather enchanting. Someone once asked, after all he'd seen and done, what Simon wanted to be remembered for. Irony, he said. I'd like to be remembered for irony. A little bit later in the broadcast, we're going to show you one of Bob's most beloved stories, another favorite subject of his, the triumph of the human spirit. And this just in, Macy's announced a plan for New York City's Thanksgiving Day Parade. For the first time in its more than 90-year history, the celebration will be a television-only event because of the pandemic. The special presentation will showcase the parade's signature mix of giant character balloons, floats, and performers. The traditional parade route will not be used this year. The previously selected regional high school and college marching band performances will be deferred to next year's parade. The traditional giant balloon inflation public event on Thanksgiving Eve's, if Eve rather is also canceled for this year. And we begin with the COVID surge, and the data makes it clear just how quickly the virus is spreading. Yesterday in New York State, there were more than 21,000 positive cases reported. That is a new pandemic record. The positivity rate, nearly 8%. That is now up from 5.8% just three days before. And there is some breaking news tonight. We just learned that all remaining performances of the Christmas Spectacular starring the Radio City Rockettes have been canceled for the rest of the season due to the breakthrough cases. CBS 2's Alice Gaynor live now outside of Radio City Music Hall with more. Disappointing news for fans, that's for sure, Alice. Oh, that's right, Christine. I mean, people are still showing up here thinking they have tickets to the performances. They didn't just cancel those four performances today. They canceled them for the rest of the season as of a few minutes ago, releasing a statement that says they are unable to continue performances due to increasing challenges from the pandemic. You know, they performed more than 100 shows over the past seven weeks. Now people will be getting their money back. Some were already seated, others in line outside. They came back in the line. They were like, it's canceled. And we were like, these grandparents came in from North Carolina just to take their grandkids to the performance. Happy.
how would you imagine that I would feel right now? I'm disappointed for them especially. First, several Broadway performances. Now Radio City closed the curtain. Broadway is huge for us. Vijay Dandapandi is president and CEO of the Hotel Association of New York City. Last week, the city had its best ever occupancy end rate since the pandemic started. So the occupancy was 81%. Are you concerned that all of these closures are going to affect the progress you've made? Well, yeah, they're certainly going to arrest it for now, uh, temporarily. This current weekend that's coming is still is still okay. The show cancellations combined with holiday party cancellations and delays in return to office aren't helping Manhattan dig out of its economic hole. The Partnership for New York City surveyed major employers at the end of October. And of Manhattan's one million office workers, 28% were at the workplace on an average weekday, with 49% expected by end of January. Now those numbers are dropping again. The lack of office workers business travelers and tourists has kept consumer-oriented services, things like restaurants and bars, retail, really leisure and hospitality just generally from bouncing back. As the path of the virus goes, so does the path of the economy. Now, for some, that path has been right out of Manhattan. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York saying that Fairfield County, Connecticut, and northern New Jersey have benefited from all of this because people who used to commute here into Manhattan are now working from home in those areas and spending their money in those local economies. Now, back to the breaking news. Radio City Music Hall behind me here. They just announced moments ago they are canceling the rest of their performances this season. We've also just learned that Alvin Ailey is canceling the rest of its performances as well. Do stay with CBS 2 News and we will continue to bring you the very latest on all of this breaking news as it comes to us. We are live in Midtown. Christine, Alice Gaynor, CBS 2 News. All right, Alice, it's changing every minute. The impact here, more information. Hamilton shows canceled through Sunday. MJ the Musical, dark through December 26th. Moulin Rouge canceled tonight, along with Mrs. Doubtfire, which doesn't resume until next Tuesday. Tina, the Tina Turner Musical, just announced shows are canceled through Monday.